Tonight's speaker is uh, Professor Douglas Farrow, who is a professor of Christian thought and current holder of the Kennedy Smith Chair in Catholic Studies at McGill University in Montreal. Uh, originally from British Columbia, uh, he has the uh, PhD degree from King's College London, uh, where indeed he formerly taught. Among his recent books are Sense and Theology, 2011, and Desiring a Better Country, Forays in Political Theology, published in 2015, of which I see some copies on the table in the back. Uh, Professor Farrow is a member of the Academy of Catholic Theology and of the Advisory Council for the Institute on Religion and, Publish and Public Life, the, the First Things guys. He's a frequent contributor to First Things and other journals. He serves on the advisory board of Nova et Vetera and is co-editor of Ashgate's Great Theologians series. He also received uh, Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for his contributions to public discourse on significant social issues. This evening he will address us on the myth of autonomy. Uh, welcome, Professor Farrell. Thank you very much. <coughs> I was, I am very grateful to uh, Thomas Levergood and the other kind folk at the uh, Lumen Christi Institute and uh, for the invitation and uh, very happy to address you this afternoon. Certainly a pleasure to be here at this venerable university which I've not actually had occasion until uh, the present moment to visit and uh, I'm already enjoying my time here. I come to speak to you about autonomy, as you know, a concept that's being asked to do a great deal of work these days in the public sphere on both sides of the border. I want to take as my starting point the opening words of the preamble to Canada's new euthanasia legislation, Bill C-14, which is currently before the House and will become law in approximately a fortnight. It begins like this. Whereas the Parliament of Canada recognizes the autonomy of persons who have a grievous and irremediable medical condition that causes them enduring and intolerable suffering and who wish to seek medical assistance in dying. That's the opening words of the preamble. Uh, autonomy, the first and the primary justification offered for the change affected by C-14 which is to make what was formerly a criminal act, whether helping someone commit suicide or actually doing the killing, an act both legal and deserving of state support. Section 14 of Canada's Criminal Code currently states that no person is entitled to consent to have death inflicted on him, and such consent does not affect the criminal responsibility of any person by whom death may be inflicted on the person by whom consent is given. Section 241 adds that everyone who A, counsels a person to commit suicide, or B, aids or abets a person to commit suicide, whether suicide ensues or not, is guilty of an indictable offense and liable to imprisonment for a term not exceeding 14 years. These two sections represent a very traditional respect for the sanctity of life. They were invalidated last year by our Supreme Court in Carter versus Canada. The heart of that judgment appears in the case summary, which observes that these sections of the criminal code deprive those with irremediable conditions causing intolerable suffering of their right to life, liberty, and security of the person, as guaranteed in Section 7 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I quote from the uh, legislation, or sorry, from the judgment. The right to life is engaged where the law or state action imposes death or an increased risk of death on a person either directly or indirectly. Here the criminal code prohibition deprives some individuals of life as it has the effect of forcing them to take their own lives prematurely 
for fear that they would be incapable of doing so when they reached the point where suffering was intolerable. The rights to liberty and security of the person, which deal with concerns about autonomy and quality of life, are also engaged. An individual's response to a grievous and irremediable medical condition is a matter critical to their dignity and autonomy. The prohibition denies people in this situation the right to make decisions concerning their bodily integrity and medical care and thus trenches on their liberty. And by leaving them to endure intolerable suffering, it impinges on their security of the person." End quote from Carter. I continue to marvel at the remarkable claim of the court that one is unjustly deprived of life if one is resolved to kill oneself at some future point and finds that one must do so sooner rather than later because one fears that later one may not have the strength, indeed the autonomy, to follow through on one's own. This represents a kind of dexterity, let us say, that even your own court's performance in Obergefell, about which a word or two later, hardly matches. The new logic of fear, fear of suffering, trumps the old logic of the sanctity of life. Suffering, not death, is the last enemy. And you may thwart it, if you like, by cutting your life short. Indeed, you have a right to thwart it, and a right to be aided by the state in doing so. Let us set aside the fact that this transforms the concept of medicine, which is no longer the art of healing and or accompanying, but only the instrument for eliminating suffering. Where it cannot do so to the satisfaction of the patient by keeping her alive, it can, and upon request must, do so by killing her. If the suffering is not eliminated, in other words, then the sufferer will be eliminated instead. It does not take any great dexterity of mind to see that every patient, and not only those determined to die rather than to face suffering, stands in a different relation to medicine so conceived and to doctors prepared thus to act than was formerly the case. But it is not medicine itself, but rather the notion of autonomy that here requires the medical profession to submit to the legal profession that most concerns us. Autonomy, or rather, autonomy and dignity. For it is this hendiadus which lies at the heart of the judgment. And hendiadus, as you know, is a pair of terms yoked together as a single idea. This one occurs in Carter at least half a dozen times. What does it mean and how does it function? It functions, I dare say, as a hermeneutical key that guides the court, both in its appeal to the principles of fundamental justice and in its reading of prior law. As for what it means, we are told but little, but can glean, I think, quite a lot. Autonomy sometimes appears on its own or in connection, say, with, quote, control over one's bodily integrity, free from state interference. That's from section 64, quoting Rodriguez, the court's 1993 decision upholding the same criminal provisions that are here being struck down. But usually it's paired with dignity, as at paragraph 59, where we hear somewhat more expansively of personal autonomy and fundamental notions of self-determination and dignity. Autonomy and dignity seem to mean, above all, self-determination. It is in self-determination that both autonomy and dignity reside. To this we must return, of course. But since you are indulging me like good hosts, while I, like an ill-mannered guest, discuss a case from a foreign jurisdiction, permit me first to complete my little sketch of Carter. The court reasons that persons have a right to life, but no duty to live. <laughs> 
Making a rather egregious error in logic, it equates not having a duty to live with not having a duty not to kill oneself. It notes that suicide is no longer a crime, though we still find occasion to discourage it. It then proceeds to reread the law in this light and to assert that the purpose of the prohibition against aiding and abetting suicide is simply to prevent suicide from being chosen when people are vulnerable to making a poor choice. That is, when their powers of self-determination are at a low ebb. <coughs> Having got this far, the court observes that the prohibition on assisted suicide of course, it prefers the euphemism assisted dying or the even more perverse medical aid in dying, fails due to its overbreadth. For the pro prohibition is absolute and so catches in its net those people who freely and competently resolve on suicide or, as needs be, euthanasia. That is their right, a right grounded in their autonomy and dignity. Dying, says the court, is part of living, and an individual's choice about the end of her life is entitled to respect. It seems fair to say that the court, and when I say the court, I mean the entire court, for the judgment was unanimous, not only understands our autonomy and dignity to reside in our self-determination, but thinks of the latter as something entirely self-referential. To be sure, our profound respect for life and our collective belief in the dignity and worth of every person ground the principles of fundamental justice, this, this the court says. What they are themselves grounded in, however, no one seems to remember. Moreover, these commitments seem to lack specification and objective points of reference other than what is provided by self-determination. That is why they do not apply to the unborn and will not likely in the future apply to those with dementia, for example. At all events, they do not permit any collective judgment on suicide or euthanasia as good or evil acts. Rather, they require us to validate individual responses to the situation of suffering, whatever the response might be. For, as we have already heard, an individual's response to a grievous and irremediable medical condition is a matter critical to their dignity and autonomy. The court concerns itself not at all with whether fear of temporal suffering or the remedy of suicide should be subjected to public moral scrutiny. One's judgment in such matters, if more or less freely made, is self-authenticating. Neither does it worry about the fact that the notion of personal autonomy involving control over one's bodily integrity, free from state interference, again the court's words, has morphed into a positive right, entitling one, on the grounds of one's autonomy no less, to state assistance. How does that happen? A simple trick, really. Suicide and euthanasia are dubbed made medical aid in dying. We should not mistake this for an ordinary squeamish sort of euphemism. The adjective medical guarantees universal access to services, at least it does in a socialist medical system like Canada's. And it guarantees patient autonomy in the directing of those services. So abandonment of the duty not to kill oneself leads to abandonment of the duty not to kill another, and indeed to the obligation under certain circumstances of agents of the state, for such are doctors and nurses in that system, to kill another. A simple trick, I say, whether consciously or subconsciously performed, but not just a trick. It's a decision to change the moral law and so to change positive law, even if that means throwing rights into conflict, as such a move always does. <clears throat> 
The rights of patients who desire made now conflict with those of medical practitioners who don't wish to provide it. And with those of the many other patients who would like to preserve medicine as the art of curing and accompanying, patients who do not wish to be confronted with encouragement to request made so as to relieve the public of further responsibility for them, or indeed to be treated by those who practice made. The devil is in the details naturally and not merely in the decision to change the moral law. Under what circumstances is the state obligated to support suicide or to kill? And how will these conflicting rights be balanced? But we're not going to concern ourselves with all of that. You've borne with this juridical Canadiana long enough. I want to suggest to you that what we have here is a typical instance of appeal to the myth of autonomy that now governs Western culture. And to show you, if you need showing, that the myth of autonomy is a story we tell ourselves about who we think we are or who we fancy ourselves to be rather than about who we actually are. This means saying something about how we came to tell this story, why we must stop telling it, and what is needed if we are to start telling a truer and more accurate one. First then, another illustration, this time from your side of the border, and more briefly, since it's better known to you. I mentioned Obergefell v. Hodges. How's the myth of autonomy operating there? The words from Justice Kennedy sound only too familiar. I quote, a first premise of the court's relevant precedence is that the right to personal choice regarding marriage is inherent in the concept of individual autonomy. Or again, the fundamental liberties protected by the 14th Amendment's due process clause extend to certain personal choices central to individual dignity and autonomy, including intimate choices defining personal identity and beliefs. And again, there is dignity in the bond between two men or two women who seek to marry and in their autonomy to make such profound choices. This case, again, is full of the language that belongs to the myth of autonomy. That's the foundation, the starting point. Not a consideration of marriage, of what it is or even what it might be. In a hundred pages of legal controversy, not one of the nine justices attempts a definition of marriage. Though Justice Kennedy sidles up to a definition at one point, only to turn his back on it and go his way, when he says, and I quote, the nature of marriage is that through its enduring bond, Two persons together can find other freedoms, such as expression, intimacy, and spirituality, end quote. That's as close to a definition of marriage as 103 pages of legal judgment gets. Everything you see is about personal expression, in which lies dignity, which is rooted in autonomy or self-determination. Nothing else really matters. And since nothing else really matters, how are we to choose between choices? Whatever benefits accrue to one choice must be granted to another, even if that means 100 pages of legal reasoning about something that is never defined. I hope you read some of these key judgments yourself, because if you want to understand the culture in which you live, you have to do that, whatever your discipline. Did you notice in Obergefell, I had opportunity recently to point this out privately to one of the nine justices who had not noticed it, that the court slips back and forth quite heedlessly between marriage as an individual right and marriage as a couple's right. By long-standing international precedent, the right to marry is the right of an individual, not of a couple. 
Licenses are issued to two people, both of whom have decided to marry and intend to marry each other in a lawful union. But the right to marry and to found a family, per Article 16 of the Universal Declaration, is the right of every one, not of every two or any two for that matter. But the majority had to introduce this slippage into their reasoning because the myth of autonomy requires it. It was not actually marriage that they were treating, or at least not marriage as the institutional basis for founding a family, but rather the autonomy and dignity of homosexual persons. And to get where they wanted to go with that, they had to turn marriage into a couple's right rather than an individual right so that they could pretend that the right to marry was not already universal, but must be made so by the court. At the same time, of course, they had to pretend, as Justice Alito noted in his dissent, that families are constructs of the will alone and not natural outcomes at all. Moreover, as Justice Thomas observed, also in dissent, they had at points to reject the idea, I quote, that human dignity is innate and suggest instead that it comes from the government. That is, the one, that is one price exacted by the myth of autonomy as it operates here. If marriage is not really about the foundations of a family but about autonomy and dignity, and if human dignity rests on what one thinks of oneself, which rests in turn on what others think of one, it must come to rest at last on the support and goodwill of the state. So not only dignity, but marriage itself is politicized. The realm of nature and of the pre-political and all the rights appertaining there disappear. I've said much about these things elsewhere, however, and I won't elaborate them further here unless you ask me later. When we ask ourselves how we came to tell this story, how we arrived at the myth of autonomy, a proper answer becomes rather complicated. For there were a great many confluent factors over a great deal of time. Some like to single out for special mention the contributions of William of Ockham, the great 14th century nominalist, and why not? He it is who began to teach us to think in terms of the freedom of indifference that is, if I may borrow a few lines here from Desiring a Better Country, to think that the will is free even before it engages the intellect, free before it stands at the intersection created by the pursuit of happiness, man's highest end, and the pressing question of justice in that pursuit. To think that the will is free absolutely, simply as the power of choice and without reference to what is being chosen, or even to what the will is for. When we think like that, the philosophical rudiments are already in place for constructing the myth of autonomy. It would be foolish, of course, and unfair to blame everything on Occam, or for that matter, on his modern heirs in the likes of Hume or Kant or Mill. I would, had I time, happily blame a good deal of it on his contemporary, Marsilius of Padua, another polymath whose expertise straddled philosophy, medicine, politics, and law, but I don't. Some prefer to pick on that most subtle Franciscan, Dun Scotus, who a century earlier contended for the university of being, supposedly setting God and creatures, in that respect, on equal footing, while at the same time prioritizing the will and setting in motion the voluntarist train of thought. To all of that, I will only say that whatever we make of his oddly equivocal doctrine of univocity or of his emphasis on the primacy of the will, Scotus is certainly not doing in the matter of autonomy what Occam does after him. Now, Occam has many admirers and not without reason. Larry Seidentop, for example, in his book Inventing the Individual, praises Occam for defending the freedoms necessary to sustain the sphere of conscience, including what might be called its conscientious mistakes of judgment, and for resisting the assumption that morality can be enforced. 
I want to focus on this for a few moments in order to say just a little more about how we got to where we are today and why I think we must backtrack. Two points here. First, if Occam is an early champion of freedom of conscience, the tradition he helped shape already contained within itself the seeds of that freedom's destruction. How so? The human person, on Occam's view, has no access to the mind or purpose of God, except piecemeal, by special revelation. And special revelation, being fragmentary, is insufficient for an ordered understanding of creation and of human civilization. Already in Occam and Marsilius, we find precursors of the modern pact to set aside appeals to special revelation in matters of public reason. What is more, the inscrutability of the divine will and its perceived arbitrariness pass over, mutatis mutandus, to the human will. This combination does not reinforce the idea of conscience and conscience rights, but rather tends to their elimination. At the risk of a bit more Canadiana, I was not surprised to hear recently from a retired justice who sat on Carter that the court finds freedom of conscience a notion quite opaque. Yes, freedom of conscience and religion is the first enumerated fundamental freedom in our charter, but this too is an indiatus which we would not go far wrong to hyphenate. Freedom of conscience and religion may be fundamental, but they are fundamental only to the individual, qua individual, rather than to the individual as citizen. Did not Rousseau already make that clear? And the individual who claims this freedom is either claiming access to a publicly inaccessible divine order or to nothing at all. Conscience and religion claims thus recede into the realm of the non-rational. They are not perspicuous to public reason and can be accessed legally only by a sincerity test. That is, they permit only a subjective judgment as to whether they are deeply and sincerely held. Conscience and religion claims at bottom are just a subset of autonomy and dignity claims. Voices are now raised, not least in this university, asking whether they add anything specific or particularly useful, or whether they should perhaps be delisted. The freedom of indifference leads to indifference then about matters of freedom, because in the absence of a divine command theory such as Occam's, it does not know what to do with moral questions. The choice for suicide, for example, stands on level ground with the choice against suicide. The choice for marrying someone of the same sex stands on level ground with the choice for marrying someone of the opposite sex. Such choices are not morally differentiatable, as even Kant supposed them to be. They are just different expressions of the same autonomy and dignity. We may put this even more strongly. The C-14 preamble, recognizing as it does the autonomy of persons as the proper starting point for public reason, negates the already dead letter of the charter preamble, severing at last the link between the supremacy of God and the rule of law. That's what the Canadian charter, it has just one very simple whereas clause, whereas Canada is founded on principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. Well, with this new uh, judgment and this new bill, um, the link between the supremacy of God and the rule of law is finally severed, I th as I said. And where appeal to the supremacy of God is no longer made, there really is no such thing as a conscience and religion right. That kind of language is just a veneer some people choose to put on their autonomy. When the Supreme Court gets round to balancing the new right to assisted suicide and euthanasia with the old right to freedom of religion and of conscience and religion, I fully expect to see it treating both 
as nothing more than instances of a more fundamental right to autonomy, which it will have to read into the Charter, and to find it concluding that limiting freedom of conscience and religion, where it impinges on an effective medical aid in dying regime, is justifiable in a free and democratic society. You're already familiar with such moves down here, though they have lately been focused on sex and gender issues. Sex and gender. This leads to the second point I wanted to make in this uh, section of the lecture, and a further reason for backtracking. The myth of autonomy, now powerfully allied with a perverse form of human rights discourse that is at once truncated and vilely bloated, is busy evacuating the law, not only of morality and of fundamental freedoms such as conscience and religion, but of the body itself, the primary locus in which one encounters the given and learns that one is not, in fact, autonomous. To maintain the myth of autonomy, the body must be eliminated, and that is exactly what we are now witnessing at law and less consistently in the culture at large. Daniel Moody, in a little book called The, the Flesh Made Word, which appeared earlier this year, has observed, quite rightly in my judgment, that the process of eliminating the body from law takes its main impetus from the practice of abortion. Having refused to identify some humans as persons, we have been forced to advance ever more restrictive theories of personhood and personal dignity as residing in the capacity to plan, to purpose, and to act autonomously, such that human nature itself, insofar as it concerns the body, is removed from our calculations. This logic, which is already the logic of contraception, but required the abortion industry in order to become entrenched at law, led in short order to the redefinition of marriage, that is, to an understanding of marriage wholly detached from bodily givens and from the procreative nature of sex. At the same time, it led to GM, not General Motors, which had its own troubles, but gender mainstreaming which has already achieved a number of its key objectives, including the detachment of personal identity at law from sexual identity, a concept which has been replaced by gender identity, understood as a purely volitional construct that can be altered absolutely at will and without any reference to the body whatsoever. The irony that this movement has proved so draconian and coercive trampling on the rights of others is much commented on. But unless I miss my guess, there is more to come. Some of it connected to our growing investment in transhumanism. As Martin Rothblatt, or Martin as he now calls himself, puts it, we are moving towards a new species, which he likes to refer to as persona creatus, a species independent of our present biological substrate, as he calls the body. Much of this is pure fancy, of course, despite its major corporate backers. Yet one is well advised to ponder the final chapter of Steve Fuller's Humanity 2.0, which provides a bold program, almost a charter, we might say, for the coercion that will be necessary in order to pursue transhumanist goals. The goals may not be achievable, but the willingness of our elites to coerce is already abundantly evidence, evident, and that in areas where they are supported by not a single shred of common sense. So what is needed if we are to start telling a truer and more accurate story? With what shall we challenge the myth of autonomy? Perhaps we may take our cue from St. Anselm, who before the turn of the 12th century, while still at Beck, responded in uncharacteristically heated fashion to the teachings of Rosalinus Compendiensis, the father of nominalism. Rosalin not only held concepts such as genus and species to be mere abstractions, he held that even the word God 
is an abstraction. In the fourth century, Gregory Nazianzen had famously said, when I say God, I mean Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, indicating thus that the divine usia cannot be abstracted from the divine persons. But Rosslyn pressed this truth in a false direction, a tritheistic direction, and persisted in doing so even after recanting at the Synod of Soissons in 1092. Anselm wrote against Rosslyn in De Incarnazione, published shortly after from the See of Canterbury, as follows, I quote, those modern dialecticians, nay, heretics of dialectic, who consider universal substances to be merely sounds, flatus vocus, should be completely blown off, ex suffliandi, in debates about spiritual questions. For how can those who do not yet understand how several men are in species one man, understand in that most secret and highest nature how several persons, each of whom is perfect God, are one God? How can those who cannot understand anything to be man except an individual, understand man except as a human, as, <coughs> sorry, let me say that again, uh, those who cannot understand anything to be man except an individual will in no way understand man except as a human person, for every individual man is a person. How then will they understand man to be assumed by the word, that is, that another nature, not another person, is assumed? Now you may think that's, you know, this technical Trinitarian and incarnational God talk that what does it matter? Well, actually I think this dispute represents a watershed in Western intellectual history. Cascading down Rossland's side is the whole nominalist tradition within which has been spun the myth of autonomy, a myth we might have approached through a thousand other texts, not of legal genre necessarily, but any number of other genres. Not to put too fine a point on it, this tradition knows only individuals and collections of individuals, and the state, the increasingly Leviathan-like state that mediates between individuals. Flowing down the other side, Anselm's side, is a Trinitarian and incarnational tradition which knows rather persons in communion, being as communion, ecclesial and Eucharistic realities. The former, having, to use Anselm's words, plunged rashly into complex questions concerning divine things without first striving in firmness of faith for earnestness of life and of wisdom have been ensnared by a persistent falsehood, producing an individualist anthropology in which autonomy came to be the defining characteristic, as it never could have done had the path of discourse about personhood, which was first opened up by the fourth century Trinitarian debates, been faithfully followed. So far has this individualist anthropology been pressed in our time that we are now ensconcing in law the precise notion of autonomy that Anselm had already described in De Casu Diaboli as the very essence of the primal fall. In chapter four of that work, written just before the controversy with Rosslyn broke out, Anselm says of the devil that he deprived himself of his own proper nature by willing falsely to be like God. I quote, even if he did not will to be wholly equal to God, but something less than God, against the will of God, by that very fact he, inordin he inordinately willed to be like God because he willed something by his own will as subject to no one. It is for God alone thus to will something by his own will such that he follows no higher will. Not only did the devil will to be equal to God in presuming to have his own autonomous will, but he even willed to be greater by willing what God did not want him to will because he put his will above God's." End quote. Anselm no doubt immediately intuited where all this Rosalinus business was going. We at all events know where it has gone. 
The autonomous human will has usurped that which formerly belonged to the divine will and wisdom without any consideration of divine law. Recall the famous passage from Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which I expect you have memorized having heard it so many times. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of life, human life. This contention is as foolish and as futile as the devil's own and is indeed its derivative. Even were we to suppose that the devil willed to be like God in some fashion that God himself willed the devil in due course to be like God, a reasonable supposition, the autonomous character of this willing doomed the devil as it dooms man to the path of self-destruction that this path leads to an attack on the body itself should not surprise us, just because the body is for man the locus of the given. That it leads to an attack upon the church should not surprise us either. For the refusal to learn the goodness of the body through the incarnation of the Son, the refusal to receive the dignity of personhood through the Son, which is to say non-autonomously, in communion with the Father, as gift rather than achievement, means that the ecclesial body is the body that cannot be tolerated. Anselm again seemed to sense the danger when at the outset of De Incarnazione, he laid great stress on the nominalist rejection of ecclesial methods and authority. Before I examine this question, he says, meaning Rosslyn's view of the Trinity, I will say something to curb the presumption of those who with blasphemous rashness and on the ground that they cannot understand it, dare to argue against something which the Christian faith confesses. Those who judge with foolish pride that what they are not able to understand is not at all possible, rather than acknowledging with humble wisdom that many things are possible which they are not able to comprehend. Indeed, no Christian ought to question the truth of what the Catholic Church believes in its heart and confesses with its mouth. Rather, by holding constantly and unhesitatingly to this faith, by loving it and living according to it, he ought humbly and as best he is able to seek to discover the reason why it is true. If he is able to understand, then let him give thanks to God. But if he cannot understand, let him not toss his horns in strife, but let him bow his head in reverence. For self-confident human wisdom can, by thrusting, uproot its horns more quickly than it can, by pushing, roll this stone. I almost think Anselm, well, he did grow up in the mountains as I did. Needless to say, his advice was not widely heeded. As nominalism advanced over the next five centuries, Attacks on the authority of the church were eventually focused on its teaching about the body of Christ in its most literal sense, that is, on the real presence in the Eucharistic gift. It would be another five centuries before today's open assault on the human body as such. Now, the myth of autonomy, if left unchecked, will certainly uproot the horns of human wisdom. Nay, it already has. Our transgender wars are proof enough of that. The once great America, reduced to debating who can use a bathroom. Well, because after all, to be perceived as what you say you are is a basic human right. Now, one may be tempted to retort to that. Why not just say you are someone who doesn't need to pee? But that would provide no solution to the bathroom wars. For as Tertullian once said, man is as much body as he is soul, and bodies in their present state do need to pee. That being true for us also, I'll do my best to answer my own question in a couple of minutes so I can sit down and, and you can go to the loo. The right response to the myth of autonomy is not to repudiate the very idea of autonomy, but to get autonomy right by appeal to the faith of the church. St. Irenaeus liked to refer to man, or at least to Christian man, as homo gratus, the man who renders thanks for what is given, 
the man who is caught up in an economy of giving that is, so to say, eucharistically financed by God. It is homo gratus who discovers what it really means to be like God and so to be free. Irenaeus was familiar in its fledgling Gnostic form with persona creatus, but he knew that those who reject the body find the whole man lapsing into unreality, not advancing in liberty. He knew that to advance in liberty, it is necessary to advance in self-rule. He also knew, however, that self-rule entails holding fast to the good. It is only thus that the faculties of the soul become disciplined, he says, in the practice of things pertaining to God, and that the soul itself eventually receives a faculty of the uncreated through the gratuitous bestowal of eternal existence. As for those who go beyond the law of the human race and even before they become men wish to be like God, their creator, they are more destitute of reason than dumb animals. For how shall he be a God who has not as yet been made a man? Only by preserving the framework of God's workmanship can man ascend to that which is perfect." End quote. That's a series of quotations. The test of human autonomy lies just there. Those who fail the test subject themselves to the aims, he says, of the one who envies our life, the, the, the devil, the evil one who seeks to render us disbelievers in our own salvation and blasphemous against God the Creator. Well, I don't know how much Irenaeus Anselm knew, but I am struck by the similarity of his own arguments in De Libertate Arbitrii and De Casu Diaboli. The latter begins with the same question, what do you have that you have not received? And tries to show that the whole process of creation and perfection is a participation in the divine economy of gift. It's the short-circuiting of that autonomy by the would-be autonomous will, of that economy by the would-be autonomous will. That's how the fall occurs. Anselm and Irenaeus are on the same page. Human dignity lies in the very thing the devil falsely claims God does not want for man, namely that he should be like God. And what kind of freedom has the man whom God wants to be like God? His freedom lies in the power to choose godliness for himself by preserving, as the devil did not, rectitude of will for its own sake. It lies in the power to preserve justice, which, as Augustine says, orders everything properly under God. This is what man's autonomy, in the proper sense, his capacity for self-rule, his freedom of decision, is for. It is not for determining his own nature or declaring his independence of God's design, but for choosing to realize and fulfill that design. And it is for this also, that just so he should be found in a godlike way to have contributed something to his own ultimate justice and freedom and happiness, which will at once be gift and reward. For in all these things, God is solicitous of human happiness. Well, in Irenaeus and in Anselm, which I like to prescribe together as an antidote to the myth of autonomy, we encounter a very different kind of anthropology an anthropology of communion and of liberation that must be learned in communion. And we encounter it in forms comprehensive enough and subtle enough, though I have not tried to show that here, to carry into the fora of our own disciplines and professions and to make good on them in countless ways. But do I seriously mean to suggest that these things, which are learned in Lumini Christi, ought to guide society at large and the state itself in a revision of its concept of autonomy, leading to a repudiation of what I've been calling the myth of autonomy? Do I mean to say that C14, for example, should begin not with a gesture of faith in that myth, but perhaps with something like this, whereas the Parliament of Canada recognizes that God is the author and giver of life? vivificans, 
or that the Obergefell decision should have begun whereas this court recognizes that man is made male and female? Would this not be a violation of the doctrine of separation of church and state, as Americans put it, or of secular neutrality, as Canadians say? Well, yes, I do mean to say these things, and yes, it would violate those doctrines. But I ask you in turn, what are those doctrines as currently taught with all earnestness, if not the myth of autonomy applied to the state? That, however, is the subject for tomorrow's seminar, so I uh, will welcome your questions and what has been said this afternoon. Thank you.